I love this job because there's real justice in the amount you receive from the amount of effort that you put into it. Hey guys, what is up? Welcome to episode 004 of How to Invest in Commercial Real Estate. We are joined today by a special guest, Neil Daly. Thanks for coming yeah, on, Thanks man. for having me here. Neil. What's up, guys? Also joined by our co-host, Joel Thompson and uh, Brian Duck. Brian is obviously my partner in the Criterion Fund, and, and Joel is a co-founder of Precision, um, both commercial real estate agencies. And, and Neil is actually the, um, what's your title, Neil? Uh, commercial real estate broker. I started the commercial division at McGraw. So McGraw Realtor is a very well-known well name in residential real estate here in Oklahoma. Now across the state recently this year, we made an acquisition to stretch us across the state and into Northwest Arkansas, uh, but started the commercial division uh, 12, 15 years ago at McGraw and have grown it. And now we have property management. We have silos of retail, office, industrial, uh, multifamily guys have really done well. And uh, now into property management, looking at corporate services and now an energy sector. Um, oh my so gosh. It's getting nice. It's getting big. So it's yeah. taken Very off. cool. So how many um, people do you guys have over there now? It seems like you guys have been growing like crazy, especially in the multifamily side recently. Yeah, we have. And it's kind of taken a life of its own. And as we have brought people on, they have, I, I, over the last couple of years, really tried to isolate into silos. I, say, I want you not just to say you do commercial, but I want you to be a specialist at that particular job. Take, for example, if the newspaper is looking for a quote on a recent story, they want to call an authority on the subject. I want you to be the authority on that, whatever it is that you want to do. If, yeah. it's, if it's office, if it's retail, if it's industrial, be so well known in that. That doesn't mean you can't you know, dabble in the other transactions or if you have a good client doing something else, but, but be known for really being good at, at that one thing. So niche, niche down. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you look at some of the people that have been the most successful in the brokerage community, it's those people that have done one thing and done it really well, right? So if you look at the industrial guys, that's all they do is industrial and retail. That's all they do in retail. And you can look around in all the different markets that we that we are in and then say, all right, who's the top person and why are they successful? It's because that's the only thing they do. Now getting started, that's really tough to take a 25 or 30 year old person yeah. and go, now you need to really, you don't know anything about that multifamily deal, right? You do retail and you do it really well. And I know you can make, you know, 50,000 or a hundred thousand dollars on that commission, but the chances of you taking that on, since you don't know anything is going to take you away from your endeavors in, in yeah. retail and likely you're going to screw up the deal or you're going to miss something or you're going to be liable for something and it's going to damage you and your reputation. Refer that still get a fee, but continue down your path. So yeah. is the silo because uh, they become an expert in that particular area or because they get a name and so people come to them or, or a little bit of both? Or Yeah. So if, if you want to say, um, look at the evolution. So you have on the residential side, everybody's seen them. Uh, the business card says, you know, I do residential and commercial. So jack of all trades. What, mm -hmm. what really, if you, if you drill that down, they're great people and they're, they're good at what they do, but... It's so hard being so knowledgeable about just one subject, if you really think about it. I mean, if, if you did residential and commercial, you would have to be an expert on every subdivision mm -hmm. and every level of investment all over a given territory. Right. Then you want to do commercial, so that means you're going to have to be familiar with the uh, commercial lending rates. And uh, if you're doing tenant rep or if you're doing landlord representation, if you're doing industrial, you know, what are the, the key factors in in multifamily metrics. And there's right. no way one person can be an expert in all that. So yeah, that to sense. the general consumer, recognize that if you're working with someone that says, I'm an expert in all of this, it is They're not. almost impossible. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I've worked with brokers all over the country and I've never um, come across a super successful broker that does anything more than one thing. It, it's it, so hard. Retail, uh, multifamily, uh, there's a little crossover with uh, single tenant because single tenant may have retail and single tenant may have industrial, but it's still a single tenant right. uh, expertise. Correct. 
But I, I completely agree. You have to specialize um, or you're, you're really going to flounder. I think if you really want to go to the top of the game, the top of the industry, you've got you to be an expert and a specialist. Yeah, and I'm kind of a Buffett fan and a Steve Jobs fan, and that that's two big things that they just say over and over again. It's just it's not what you say yes to. It's it's all the things that they said no to. Right. Um, I'm at a stage now that we have brought people in that I still have people call me and say, hey, can you help us with this office, retail, blah, 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 whatever it is. If it's not directly in my wheelhouse or where I, I want to be, then we have – people on the team that that fits for, right? Hey, can you help us find this 1500 square foot office or this thousand square foot retail space? Or can you list this long John Silver's for us? I'm like, yes. And then I would call Kayla or Carrie yeah. Lee or Julie or yeah. you know, we can, or, I can, <laughs> we can. Yeah. 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 I can quarterback it. And, and that's good. Now I have the ability to stay on those emails and I'll keep up with the chain of flow. And, you know, if there's a question that comes in, if that person has, you know, has questions, then we'll talk offline and say, all right, well, this is how you would structure that answer. This is probably who you would want to call for that. So okay. we have that team and it's very organic. We've started, uh, we haven't, you know, bought other groups to come in. We've started uh, recruiting people that have had a real estate license. Maybe they worked a year or two at another company, but we're looking for more direction. And we have a great culture. Uh, we have great leadership. Uh, we have now territory. Now as we it expanded across the state now in northwest arkansas it's really a fun time yeah good so good so uh, i'll ask you a question um so many times uh brokers are experts in commercial real estate and this shows about how the average person can can get in as, as an owner uh start making uh, passive cash flow uh, I know you own some stuff. Um, what do you think are the challenges for brokers um, trying to move into the ownership uh, position? Because so many times it, it seems like uh, they are they just stay on the brokerage side uh, and don't ever become uh, an owner. There's a couple philosophies. When I was getting started, I talked to some some guys I really looked up to in the business, and they said, "A one, I don't want to compete with." my clients. Sure. All right. I don't want to seem like I'm scooping the deals as they come into the house. Absolutely. I ended yeah, taking up taking the best them. deals. That's exactly right. Here's my leftovers. That's exactly right. And there are people that, that get a reputation for that. Mm -hmm. um, there are philosophies for the people that do the deals of, Hey, I'm in the investment world as well. I'll reach out to clients and maybe we, we, we syndicate this or we go in as partners or things like that. Uh, the way I started would, would help me not only talk the talk, but walk the walk was, I bought a, a rental house. It was a $25,000 rental house. I borrowed all the money plus $1,500 for carpet. And I was 24, mm -hmm. 25 years old. All the money That's plus awesome. $1,500. <laughs> yeah. At 12 and three quarters percent. There's a hard money oh, lender wow. in North Tulsa that said, I will do it. Um, and it was amazing how much I learned in that. You know, it was only 25000 But the lessons that you learn and how the banking system works at that age was fantastic. So I learned it's easier to refi than it is originate, right? So I can go to this guy, I can pay 12 and three quarter percent on uh, $25,000 or 26, five, I can get at least and then go refi. It. And th yeah. at the time, this is something where they would go off of appraised value, it would appraise for 42,000, I pay off the original loan, and now I have a delta. Now I can go take that. That sounds eerily familiar. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. That's, right. that's how we got our start. So yeah. it's so it's obviously a decent plan. You know, if this is both how both of you guys are, are starting, somebody yeah. needs to take some notes on this. And so it's just learning how to do that because you're going to learn about leases. You're going to be learning about the financing of it, insurance. Now you're developing all of your your vendors. You're going to meet other landlords in that space. You're going to meet you know tips. You're going to get tips and tricks which are applicable to shopping centers and multifamily centers. Uh, the, the mechanics of it are all the same. It's just, you just add more commas as you get into larger investment property. Right, and I, I think we mentioned that in a previous yeah. uh, podcast, how it's it's arguably the same thing, buying a house, buying a $5 million shopping center, but same processes. Brokers that get into that have never crossed that barrier. It's a real big gut check to go in and sign on the other line. So take philosophy you know, out of it. It's It's, really committing and yeah. even the biggest talkers have a hard time actually signing you know I, I, I think uh, we'll, we haven't talked too much about risk and risk taking 
and getting comfortable with, with that. But I, that's absolutely the case. I see guys that they, they understand the deals, they know the metrics, but, but putting your own money down and assuming the liability for a three or $4 million mortgage, right. When it may or may not work, you just don't know. Most people just can't get comfortable with, with being uncomfortable. That's right. And so, I think I love that. Can we man, <laughs> get comfortable being uncomfortable? Sorry yeah. That you're going to be on, if you get into this game and you want to take, uh, if you want to get do big deals like we're doing, um, it took me years. I mean, I'm still on some deals slightly uncomfortable. Every time I buy a deal, there's some level of uncomfort, uh, because I just don't know how it's going to work out and I'm using other people's money in my own. But man, you've got to be, you got to get, that'll be there for years, for the yeah. first few years. And I think starting with houses, like what we did, you're able to get comfortable with it because it's a, it's a number that I know it's insured. So if it burns down, right, if it gets wrecked or knocked over by a tornado, it's covered from insurance. So if I lose a tenant, I'm not going to be out of tenant forever. Right. So let's think through that. So my risk is mitigated by having to go out and find another tenant, which they can certainly do. Uh, can they wreck a house? Sure, but it's drywall and paint and carpet and you can fix it. Um, so you get comfortable thinking about the ways to mitigate your risk. Yeah. And you do it at a $25,000 level or 30,000 or 40,000 houses and you build up tolerance to it. So now that's now it's time for us to go buy a million dollar shopping center or two million or five million or $20 million apartment complex. So now I want to grow into it. Interject there. I think that was a really good point. And and saying we need to start in residential houses in that $25,000 house because you learn how to do it. But theoretically, somebody could go get you know their real estate license and get into a commercial real estate firm and, and kind of start that way, like you were saying. You, niche down into, into shopping centers, get an apprentice, and then broker that deal, learn how to do it, take the notes, learn the lingo, learn how to walk the walk and talk the talk, and then... Is this a biography? Yeah. <laughs> an autobiography? And, and that, the, the knowledge, <laughs> what I've found is the, the, the more knowledge you get, the, the less risky it feels. That's correct. And so you, by, by getting the knowledge and working with others that are doing it and see, seeing others do it, uh, the, the risk level comes down. Yeah. And one other point I want to make while I'm thinking about it, early on, you know, my wife and I had a, a lot of discussions uh, about the risk portion and it made her really, really uncomfortable. Right. And, and, and she's not by nature a risk taker, but I knew that we had to, to go down this path. And, and you know, having the mentor saying that failure is part of the journey, I, I knew we had to be prepared to, to, you know, fail financially or file bankruptcy. The key that I want people listening to, to think about is uh, I, asked, I asked my wife, what can we lose by, by failing financially? Because, I, you know, I had a day job, didn't make a lot of money, but bankruptcy is not the end of the world. They, they couldn't, as long as I make my house payment, they can't take my house. As long as I Homestead. make, as long as I t uh, make my car payment, they can't take my car. Uh, and as long as I perform at my job, um, they can't take that. Right. They can only, you know, you, and so then I, I began to let her, we're not going to lose our friends. We're not going to lose our family. And, and so right. then you just drill down, what is the fear and what, and what is it that they're going to take if you, if you fail and ultimately the things that are important in life, you're not going to lose by, by failing on a real estate deal. Right. So take a deep breath, relax, you can do this. Right. And whatever failure comes your way, like we talked about earlier, it's just part of the learning process. So, yeah. Yeah. If you have a mentor in it, if you find somebody, I mean, uh, there was a guy in our office, Kerry Velez, uh, we were at a, we were at a, a house uh, it was an Easter party and our kids were over there and we were just standing around and he goes, Hey, what do you do? Uh, commercial real estate. Somewhere in his life, he had met somebody that was in commercial real estate and he goes, man, I don't know what that guy does, but I want to figure it out. And so Kerry came to work and, um, uh, he, he put the time in. he came in every day, um, was terrible at it. And if he's watching this, uh, sorry, uh, bro. <laughs> uh, he sat out right, right outside my office in the cubicle and I'd listen, talk. I was like, listen, you had the deal. You had a yes, and you kept talking, oh, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and you talked him into Stop a no. It, yes, yeah. So yeah. I said that's your Achilles heel, and he's worked on it, and he's worked on it, and he's worked on it. Um, he got the analytics down. He has worked with other people, um, and ultimately has become very successful at it now. And right. so good for um, him. Yeah. yeah. And there's a lot of stories. You don't have to be a salesman to be in commercial real estate. Like you don't have to be able to be, you know, Johnny show up and you know suit and pocket square and all that kind of stuff, right? <laughs> Uh, you can be in commercial real estate. You can be on the analytics side. You can be on a team. You can be the, the, the research guy, 
or, or girl for, for that matter, uh, you can be in that in that world and still be a part of commercial real estate. That's that's one hundred percent how I started, um, and I think going back to Joel's point and your point of you know fearing the unknown, mm-hmm. that's that's so real. I mean, you just you don't know what you don't know, and and you're terrified of all these things that could go wrong because it's it's big and it's got a lot of zeros, and you're signing on the debt, and you're yep. ultimately responsible for it. And people just think, oh my gosh, I've never been responsible for something that big that right. that could ruin my life. But when you break it down, the probability and, and the practicality of that happening is is just a lot lower than I think most people right. realize. To get into this job, I, I love this job because there's real justice in the amount you receive from the amount of effort that you put into it. Um, you work hard, you go out, you prospect, you meet with people, you stay up late, you study, you write this, and da, 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 da. And then ultimately you start knowing more than the other guy and you start making contacts and you get deals. And so there's real justice in that. I worked three jobs in order to get into this wow. job. So I was waiting tables at El Chico in the evenings hmm. and I was an underwriter at State Farm Insurance and uh, doing this on the on the side and then doing a radio show I mentioned to you. Uh, yeah. It, it took a lot of sacrifice in order to get here. But I, I absolutely love it. But 100% commission is scary. Yeah. It's, it's terrifying. Yeah. So, so well, so I was going to say, um, you know, I was uh, an engineer like Brian. And uh, I, I started in, in house flipping in 2003 uh, with, with my partner, Victor uh, Whitmore. And I worked that day job um, until uh, 2016. Mm-hmm. And, and so I could have quit a little earlier, but, but I never wanted to give up, like we were talking about the safety net of that day job because of the risks. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that gave me comfort knowing that I can pay my bills if I, if I mess up on deals. Um, so I, I wouldn't suggest people, you know, I would say they, you need to try to have a stream of income on the side. And this, uh, commercial real estate can absolutely be done part time until you're big enough uh, to quit the day job. Right. I quit because I did a lease downtown and it exceeded my annual salary at State Farm. Beautiful. Yeah. I thought, all right, it's time to. Yeah. If there's the time now, it's time to reject. Yeah. 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 I did the same thing. I still was working uh, full time uh, when we started Criterion, actually. Yeah. We both were. And I I think we both ended up quitting within a week or two of closing on that first deal. Right. Mine, I think, was a few weeks before. Um, But yeah, I mean, that first deal is kind of the same thing with you. You know, you get that first deal closed that you've been hustling for, you know, maybe right. on, on the side or whatever, and then it's big enough to where you're like, okay, so, let's so, dive in. So let me turn the question on you guys. Outside of brokers, how are you finding your deals? Or are you using brokers almost exclusively? Is that how most of them come to you? Is I mean, as, you're, as your fund now is gaining notoriety, are more deals just happening, happening to come to you? Absolutely. Um, I would say a lot of them are just relationships and brokers and, hey, check out this deal. Hey, we'd love to have you be a part of this. Hey, this looks like something you previously bought or expressed interest in. I would, I would say the majority is uh, referrals and, and brokers right. you know, like yourself. Yeah. So reputation. Now that we've done some jobs uh, or, or done some deals, then, yeah, we're, we're getting more notoriety and, and more people are coming to us. So. Right. Yeah, and we talked about this in, a, in um, episode two, I think. It's it's fairly easy to fill up your email with tons of deal flow, just massive amounts of deal flow. I mean, every day I'm probably getting 50 deals and and it's sickening. It's annoying actually. And it's hard to go through and underwrite all these. What a problem. Yeah, I know. (laughs) Well, because most of them are exactly the same and you know, within seconds uh, that they're not, there's no value piece there for you. So you're just streaming through them. Can you make every deal work? I mean, if you spent time on it, I think I think that's an excellent question because I, I think so. I, I think what do you, you mean can, by make it work? So like you, I get emailed stuff all the time. It's brokers advertising stuff. And that's how you see a lot of stuff. You have to cut through the noise. Um, and ultimately, that's where you, you, you talk about just focusing on a niche. A niche uh, and as you go down, you start looking at very quick metrics. I know. So it's the industrial. I found a you know, a 20,000 square foot industrial facility that's listed for less than $50 a square foot with great clear heights and heavy power and a small yard and a fence is like, check, 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 right? But if you get one that's like the same, but it's 65 or $70 a square foot and you have to add a little here and so you have to soften up the seller and then you have to do some modification and same way with your investment deals. Uh, if you find them, 
is it really just a measure of how much time you want to spend on it to mesh it together? I, I would say prob- for, for me at, at Precision Equity, not really. Uh, you know, we're, we've only got so much time and capital. And, uh, and so a lot of these deals, if it comes across my desk and it's, you know, it's a six cap, and I, I just know that I'm not going to get my investors the return they want, or, or for me, I'm not going to get enough. After I pay the investors, there's nothing left over for me. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I can't, I can't make every, every deal work. That's what I think. I feel like it's hard to find good deals. I just, uh, went out to Memphis. We're buying a three tenant retail deal in Memphis. And, and to find that deal, I, I took maybe three hours on Crexy and I, I literally went and looked at every single deal in the country that was, uh, above an eight cap between, uh, two and 8 million. Right. And, and so th- three hours and I, I maybe handpicked eight, 10 deals uh, that I followed up on. And, and this was one of them. And it's a, it's an older guy that is getting completely out. Uh, and so he's selling every deal he has, uh, which is good. It's a good time right. to buy right. from that you time. You have people. my attention. Yeah. Uh, and, and the <laughs> broker, broker seemed cool and we went out, lo- loved it. And I think it's going to be one we close on here next month. Uh, but so for me, how we find deals is local brokers because you're going to find stuff that isn't nationally marketed. It's going to be, you know, maybe local owners. Or maybe not even listed yet. You know, maybe it's yeah. a pocket listing. That's where you hope to get to as a, as a fund guy. Yeah. Right. And then we know. also do, we've bought in deals that are nationally marketed. And you'd think there wouldn't be value there. But we saw something others didn't. Um, we find some from from lenders. I, I know bankers in town. And I, I tell them, hey, if you have struggling sellers or if you hear of an opportunity, send it my way. Right. Um, you know, we haven't gotten to the point where we're like, going through CoStar and just cold calling owners. Right. I hope to be there as we hire more people. Um, that's a, that's a great way to do it. You find people that have owned a property for, you know, 10 years, 15 years. So they, they have a very low cost basis and they don't necessarily know how much it's increased in value. And you say, Hey, if I could bring you a good offer, would you be interested in selling? And most people say yes to that, that question. Right. And, and then you get all the financials, then you underwrite it to a number that you like and shoot over the offer. And, you, know, you probably have to, it's a numbers game, probably have to do that 20, 30, 40 times. Right. But that's another way you could find them. And, and when you have those successes, do you find people go, man, you're so lucky. You always find the good ones. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they Every don't realize time. you spent months trying, like calling through all the dogs in order oh, yeah. to get to the right, right. one. It's not luck, right? It's no, just, it, it's you just it, do the work. so much. Um, and I, look, I know there are deals that I pass on that are good deals that other people make money mm-hmm. on. Right. I don't, I don't spend any time, uh, worrying about that. I can only, you know, find what I feel is, per, you know, is perceived value. And, and it just, it just does, it takes a lot of deals. And, and the reason it does is, um, you probably see this too in your inbox. If you see a hundred deals and they're all, let's say a six and a half cap and, they, and you know, kind of what they look like. And then you see one that comes along and it's a seven and a half, let's say. Okay, you have to then you dive in and say why is this one slightly different? But the only reason you know that could be a good deal is because you've looked at so many right. uh, that are at a different price point. You know how to compare. And so it really that's what you're doing. It's not that you're looking at so many deals; that you're memorizing price per foot for given markets, um, what the rents sh- should be, uh, what you know what looks the best um, for a given price, how new is it? It's you know what cap rate should it go to? So all those things you're kind of muscle memory going through when you look at so many deals. And, and then, so when, then when someone, one sticks out, uh, you, you can realize, Hey, there might be some value here. And all you're doing is you're memorizing those metrics. Do you have a core set for your, your fund members of just say, well, I, we don't get to, we don't do anything outside of these parameters or is it case by case? No, well, we don't yet. Um, we, we tend to go where our experience is, which is uh, multi-tenant retail and multifamily, but we will look at. Uh, anything. And if it's compelling enough, we might step outside that, that box, but we don't have a directive for our investors and we don't really have a fun. We just do a deal by deal structure. So. Mm -hmm. And I think what you were talking about earlier of just niching down and and paying attention, it's really hard to know all of the market statistics for every asset class for your own city, let alone any, any city outside of that. I mean, I I couldn't imagine trying to do that for more than one or two asset classes because it, it, it's hard. It's and too much I, I, information. You've yeah. got to know, and that's good that we're having Neil on. Uh, if we go into a market like like Memphis, uh, I don't own in Memphis. Uh, and so we met with property management companies in Memphis. I met with brokers in Memphis, and I met with bankers in Memphis. 
And so they're going to tell me, this is a good area. This is a good price. These are the market rents. Right. Uh, this Start is with a, a 5,000 yeah. foot view. Yeah. And, and, and so, you know, people that are thinking about how getting into or buying a deal in Tulsa, they may connect with you because of your market knowledge. And then uh, if you or, or we are going to go to another city, we're going to need to find someone like uh, Neil or another local expert. That's how you get to know Phoenix in a matter of minutes is you don't go to Phoenix and spend a year learning it. You talk to local experts and they're going to want to help you because they're going to want to find you deals, get commissions, that kind of thing. On the brokerage side of the business, how do you, so uh, there was a guy at Cushman Wakefield. That, uh, so I started with Colliers International. It was bought, or they split off. They did Cassidy Turley is bought by DTZ and then bought by Cushman Wakefield. So one of the guys that never left is now the head of the global occupier services guy named Greg Schuster. We were having, uh, they have, have an annual meeting and afterwards I went out to dinner with him. He said, all right, so you're a boutique brand locally in your market knowledge. Uh, we are a global uh, account servicer for all of these other companies. Then you have brokerage companies in the middle that are kind of regional, trying to be both. They're trying to be global. They're trying to be local. And they're not doing either one of them very well. So we call the boots on the ground whenever we need information. So same scenario where they would say, hey, here we are, Cushman Wakefield, Jones Link, LaSalle, Marks and Millichap. Mm -hmm. um, we need to know specifics on this. Would you help us with this deal? Yeah, absolutely. Right. So that's we do a lot of stuff that way as well. So we don't have a national flag, but we compete with the national flags or cooperate with other national flags that aren't necessarily already in this market. And Tulsa is an example of that where not every flag is represented. So we can help do that. So if you're a boutique in a smaller, you know, second or third tier city, that's another example of things you can do. Make inroads with some of the national yeah. ones. Yeah. Well, to, to kind of wrap this up, uh, I, I would say what I failed to do early on was was connect with the experts in markets uh, like the brokers like Neil. And so uh, I was just kind of winging it and trying to do it on my own and, and trusting sellers more more than I should have been. And so uh, a big piece of advice today and having a local expert on is encouraging people that are wanting to get in to begin dialogue with local uh, commercial real estate brokers, because they are going to know the owners in the market, they're going to know uh, the prices, the price points, uh, they're going to have the connections you need and the experience to help you uh, make fewer mistakes uh, than you would on your own. Yeah. All the vendors, the Rolodex of different people that yes. can help you in that property. Yeah. Yep. Well, um, thanks for coming on, Neil. Man, it I was really a pleasure. appreciate it. I, I love the, uh, the opportunity to sit down and talk with you guys, even if it's recorded and out for the world that, you know, it's yeah, a lot of fun. Um, I, I want to tell the story of how we met real quick, just because I, I think it's an interesting story and I think you could, you know, meet somebody else like this and sell them an amazing deal. But we didn't know each other at all. I don't, I'm not sure how we got connected. Somehow we ended up at, at Double Shot Coffee. Susan. Susan. Yeah. Okay, it was yeah. BOMA. Yeah, through BOMA. Yeah, so yeah. we were members of BOMA. Susan, um, property manager, commercial property manager, she manages, um, or I, I forgot about this, you guys manage Redbud for us. Yeah. Susan does. So yeah. Susan connected us, and you knew, you kind of knew we were maybe into multi-tenant retail or, or something right. like that. You mentioned Joel, and I had met you through Brandon. Yep. Yeah. Um, anyway, you you pitched us a deal, and kind of going back to your point on underwriting, it was, you know, it was a low cap deal, and it was one we should have thrown out in our quick and dirty. It was one Joel told me to throw out in our quick and dirty. But the real estate was appealing, right? The, the real estate was appealing. It was yeah, one of those, like you mentioned, that you know I wanted to keep underwriting it, even though I knew it didn't work. Right. Um, and it was, you know, I don't know why I did, but he almost took it like a challenge. <laughs> it was <laughs> no, and. It, luckily I think the scenario was everything lined up perfectly. Had you not, had you not done it though, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know, but you did a fantastic job calling out different things, doing the, the adjusting the seller's expectations. Yep. That's right. I had a lot of calls with those owners at nine o'clock at night. Uh, they're like, oh, well, what do you think? What do you think we can, you know, what do we need to do? And it's like, well, I mean, he's kind of spelled it out for you. I mean, this, <laughs> this, 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 is, this gets the deal done. You're going to have to take a haircut. Anyway, we still meet at Double Shot. We still talk about stupid deals we want to buy. And, and I think that's, uh, you know, taken for granted sometimes. Get out there, make those relationships, uh, connect with people selling deals in your market, buying deals in your market, and, and meet with them. A lot of things these days happen the old-fashioned way. It's the, it's the phone calls. It's the meetings. It's the in-person stuff that you can't achieve through 
an Instagram post or an email or a text message or something. You got to do it the old fashioned way. I mean, there's a human element that's still very paramount in this. Yeah. yeah. Most of our deals have happened that way. It's through uh, personal relationships that we've had. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, I think that's it for episode 004. Again, thanks for coming, guys. Really appreciate thanks, it. Thanks, Neil. Make thanks, sure to guys. like and subscribe on YouTube. Check out our website, howtoinvestincre.com, and we will be back um, in a few days. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks. Thanks.